Thank you very much. My name is Regan Davis. I'm a uh, product leader. I'm a product leader from Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I want to talk to you today about when you leave this conference and you want to make the next big leap to maybe take a step back and instead of shooting for product 2.0, why it might be helpful to shoot for product 1.5. And to start, I want to tell you about the best leadership advice I ever got, which was from a lion tamer. My father used to work for the circus in America for Ringling Brothers. Uh, he was a musician, and he wrote the music that the circus played. He rode on the train. He learned to eat fire from a drunken clown. Typical dad stuff, I assume. Uh, as a kid, we would go back to the circus every year, even though he no longer worked there. And I remember this one year, he pointed across the arena, and he said, do you see that man with the white hair and the coveralls? That's Gunther Gable Williams, the greatest lion tamer who ever lived. And I had seen Gunther Gable Williams. I was obsessed with the lion tamer as a kid of the circus. And I asked, what is he doing? And my father said, he's scooping up after the elephants. Uh, the lion tamer is the biggest star of the circus. He is the reason that people came to the circus to begin with. And I said, I don't understand. Why is Gunther Gable Williams, the greatest lion tamer who ever lived, scooping up after the elephants? Surely they must have somebody else who can do that. And my father just shrugged and he said, in the circus... Everybody scoops. And I didn't know it at the time, but that became my vision for what leadership is actually all about. Because if a lion tamer can chip in and do the hard work, then why shouldn't everyone? And I think you all here have a vision for what you want your product team and your product culture to be. And if you haven't figured one out yet, that's also okay. But that's why we come to conferences like Productized, and thank you, Productized, for having me, because I have been inspired to make the changes that I want to see in the teams that I work with. But in addition to having a vision, we also need to have a strategy. We need to know what are the first steps we're going to take. Because a vision is the ultimate goal of where you want to get to, and a strategy is the choices and paths that you take to get there. And if we're familiar with the principles of using product strategy on our own products, we can do the same thing within our teams and within our companies for our own product culture. The first thing is we want to make sure that the changes that we make in our team are actually going to help our business. Right? Ask yourself, how is this change going to improve the way our company makes decisions or the way our company makes uh, profit? Is this what's needed right at this moment or is this change maybe five years too early? And the second thing is I want you to think uh, and take a step back from how Google and Apple and Facebook, companies that have thousand product managers are organized and think about the stage and scale that you're at because what's right for them may not exactly be what's right for you at your stage. And lastly, whenever we're going to make changes, and I hope that after coming to this conference, you are inspired to make changes, we need to tell all the other people who work with us about the changes we're going to make. This mistake I have made many, many times of surprising people with the changes that I want to make in our team. Product managers are so lucky in that we sit in the nexus of all these different departments that the changes that we make actually affect hundreds of other people at our company. All right, so after going through this, you're looking for making a major change in the way you operate, and you're sort of trying to figure out what's the first step that we can take. 
I think we're all familiar with the ideas of minimal viable products, right? And how rather than focusing on just cutting across one theme, we want to take a tiny sliver that cuts across all the themes that are necessary to make our products viable. I think we can do the same thing inside our own companies and inside our own teams. So I've laid out some themes that I've found make a viable product culture. And it's being customer focused, it's being outcome driven, it's a team that is entrusted, and a team that's ultimately iterative. And I wanna talk a little bit about how to tackle some of the barriers within each of these themes, and maybe some of the first steps we can take. So you just heard uh, Gibson talk about being customer focused and customer centric and customer obsessed, and I can't wait to hear what the next synonym that's even more intense is about focusing on customers. And I work a lot in uh, enterprise B2B businesses, and I think everyone agrees that we need to be customer focused right up until we start trying to talk to people. And then suddenly it starts getting so much harder. And I start hearing lots and lots of, uh, of comments from really excellent product managers. Things like, well, I don't have access to customers or time in my day or permission to go reach out to them. And I think when I work a lot in, in B2B, product managers are telling me this as if they're the only people who want to talk to customers and aren't able to right now. But you know there's another department, usually within your company, who's struggling just like this, and it's marketing. From a co-schedule study, 65% of marketers aren't talking to their customers. And their job is to get new customers, right? And yet, when you talk to them and you say, well, why aren't you talking to your customers? You hear the exact same reasons. So here's what you can do on Monday when you go back into work. I want you to go find your marketing department. I want you to join with them. I want you to take to the streets. I want you to flip over the conference table, set fire to your toaster ovens, and maybe talk to another person in your company who actually talks to customers. So in America, in, in B2B, uh, in the enterprise world, there's huge sales departments, and they get to talk to customers every day. And it's really easy to find salespeople because they're playing ping pong right outside the conference room where I'm trying to get very important work done. In Europe, you may not have uh, huge ping pong aficionados, but I'm sure there's some miniaturized sporting event somewhere in your office that they can go to. And the point of this is to build the relationships, to go talk to people as human beings and find out what their problems are. Because the same techniques that we use to find problems from our customers, I've used to find problems from our sales teams. And then convince them that letting me talk to customers in open-ended conversations to determine the actual problem is going to help them make more money. And if you happen to work at a company where maybe you don't have a sales team, there is always one department who will happily let you get on the phone and talk to customers. Because customer service is so lucky to hear from those net promoter detractors every day, and you as a product person are able to solve their problem, or at least find out a really nice way to say, no, I'm not gonna solve your problem. So go build the relationships that will actually allow you to start finding what customers actually care about. The next step in sort of becoming a more uh, heightened product team is this focus on outcomes over output. I like to talk a lot about switching from solution-oriented thinking to problem-oriented thinking. And I think the biggest uh, artifact of solution thinking is the roadmap. A roadmap is a very powerful tool. It's very 
important for us to do the exercise and work on it. But if time equals love, this thing has more love in it than my family. And yet your customer doesn't actually care about your roadmap. What they care about is their problem. And a roadmap is just a promise to solve their problem. Because if the most exciting part of a pirate movie was the detailed and intricate map-making scenes, then I think we probably focus too much on the wrong things. But when I talk to teams about this, I get a lot of responses. I get things like, well, that's what my team needs, and that's what my executive team wants, and ultimately that's how I'm judged. Well, how many of these statements are about our customer? And how many of them are just about us? So here's a first step that I was taking to try and shift towards outcomes because it's not going to be overnight. So I was working with my founder. He's very visionary, very charismatic, has lots of solutions. And I made him a PowerPoint deck that was two slides that said, one, I want you to make bets. I'm not here to tell you no. Two, I just want to measure those bets. This is a very difficult argument to come away with. Who's ever going to say, I don't like making bets, or I shouldn't measure what happens? And once we started building a type of relationship in which we measured our bets after the fact, then all the sneaky work that I'd been doing with my product team of measuring and setting hypotheses before we built things suddenly started connecting with the type of work we were already doing. And ultimately, we were able to start shifting towards making our hypotheses first, defining what outcome we want to achieve, and then removing the argument about the feature and whether we liked it or not, because now we had data and we were treating things as bets, not as uh, decisions that we had already committed to. But to get to here, we had to have trust. I had to have the trust of my team. I had to have the trust sort of, and the relationships with my founder. And I think when you focus on being trusted, it's the first part that's necessary. You have to be trusted to execute on the decision that's been made. If you don't have trust as a product manager with your team, you're probably not going to last very long as a product manager. But the next step in this is even harder, moving from being trusted to execute to being entrusted to make that decision. And this is the sort of thing that I wish I could spend eight hours or eight weeks working with you on of how do we actually make this shift and try and move towards this. But instead, I'm going to tell you about a terrible email that I sent. So I was working on our strategy with our uh, executive team. And we were, unfortunately, going back and forth on a Microsoft Word document. Already, we are set up for success. This is the way to do it. And I had some uh, concerns with an element of the strategy. And I took out my handy Microsoft Word commenting tool, and I wrote out my thinking step by step. And I made a comment so long it broke Microsoft Word of every single critique and challenge to what this specific focusing tenant was going to be. And having broken a Microsoft Office product, I was very pleased with myself. And I sent the email. Days went by. No response. And then I followed up really helpfully. Hey, did you happen to see my comments? And I heard the phrase that probably a number of product managers in this room have heard. It was too long. I didn't read it. And instantly, I went back to feeling like there was a lack of trust. Right? 
I'm not valued, my comments, my feedback isn't warranted or isn't being paid attention to. But I took a pause for a second and I thought and stepped back and said, if I'm this frustrated, think how frustrated our CEO must feel. And so I went and I had a side conversation and I said, tell me, tell me what's going on. Tell me why we're getting to this point where we're at this impasse. And I got some really enlightening advice. She said, Regan, you lay out all of your thinking in all of this detail because you assume we don't trust you. Why don't you assume that we do trust you and just help us make a decision? And this hit me really hard because as a data-oriented person and as a product manager who feels like decision quality is an important aspect of my job, I had thought that I was building trust. And I want you all to think, how often might we be thinking that we're already not trusted? That the only value that we can bring is reactions and critiques as opposed to starting from a place of trust and helping shape the idea together. And maybe not using Microsoft Word. So lastly, I, I want you to know I didn't get it right the first time or even the second time. And you're probably not going to either. These things are gonna take a lot of iterations. That's what strategy is all about. I think we're, we're probably familiar with some of the inconvenient truths of product management that were uh, documented by the writer Marty Kagan. Um, this, by the way, not Marty Kagan. I'm really glad that joke didn't bomb in Europe. Uh, but the inconvenient truths of product is that half of our ideas are not going to work. Right? Because they're not valuable, they're not usable, they're not feasible, or they're not viable for the business. And the second inconvenient truth is that the other half of our ideas are going to take five to seven iterations to produce the value that we expect. The same is going to be true with the ideas and the changes that you want to make into your team. I hope it's not that 50% of them will fail but it is gonna be that you're gonna to have to make tweaks and changes in order to get success. This unfortunately is not a, a single path that you can go down. So what's the thing that we can do to start knowing if this is going to work? Well, we have to start measuring where we're at today. In the same way that we measure if our products are successful, we have to know the benchmark of how our culture is performing. Some of that is speed and delivery, but a lot of that is the impact of the choices that we make. So start measuring the time that you take as a product manager and how much are you spending of your effort on discovery, on strategy, on delivery, and start writing out where you want that to be. And then you can have the discussion of the, the barriers and the blockers that are in your way to get there. Start talking to your other team members, the other departments that you work with, and start finding what is the way that they measure the success of the decisions that you bring to them. Are we actually serving the people that we work with? Are we making their lives easier? And the other thing that I want you to start measuring, because it is really important in product management, which is an incredibly stressful job, is to measure your own anxiety level, to measure the stress that you feel, and start making a plan and a path in the changes that you make that might allow you to relieve some of that stress. You know, I, I was working with one of our lead product managers, and we talk a lot about feedback loops. And one of the things that he said was, I don't have time to think about strategy. I don't have time to talk to customers. 
and we laid out his day. We said, how much of your time is spent in Slack talking to your development team and answering questions? And he said, mm, about 70%. I said, how much of that 70% is you just saying, yes, I agree? Took me a week. He came back, analyzed his Slack responses. He said, about 95%. And this was an opportunity for change, right? Because what we started to shift was instead of saying, yes, I agree, to say, I trust you. And over time, we started seeing how those responses started to dwindle, and his time got to, uh, to get freed up. But at the same point, the entire team's autonomy started to increase. The entire team's ability to execute and to make their own decisions started to increase as well. This stuff is going to be hard, and it's going to feel like a stretch, but if you keep at it, ultimately, you should find that it's somewhat rewarding. Like a T-Rex trying to eat a lollipop, that it's going to feel uncomfortable, but it's going to feel really good as you start to get closer and closer to this. And I want you to focus on not any one specific practice, but creating a culture where you make continuous improvements so that everyone can start to see how this is not just about one idea or one decision, but about creating a culture in which everybody improves together. You all already know how to work and do this. You all are here because you've done this work in the products and in the interfaces and the user's experience that you all work with every day. You know that there are principles that you take within your own product to try and move and shift it forward to get to your ultimate product vision. Let's just take the same principles and turn them in on ourselves and start focusing and meeting the challenges that we have within our own teams. And in the same way that we can find and focus on these themes of being customer focused and outcome driven, moving towards being entrusted and becoming iterative, in the same way that a minimum viable product isn't just about one theme, we can take a tiny sliver across this thing and find small pilots and individual teams where we can show that this is working and create the right kind of feedback loops that will allow us to inch by inch move from product 1.5 to product 2.0 and beyond. And ultimately, in doing this, we're going to get to the vision that we have for our own product team and our own product culture. For me, that vision is a team that works like the circus. We're a bunch of highly talented, specialized people are coming together, are doing the hard work, and riding the train together, elephants included, at the end of the day, and that ultimately, with every new release or every new performance, we're amazing and delighting not just the customers who paid to see us, but we're amazing and delighting each other as well. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Vegan.